All right, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. Go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And that is not Cousin Shane. That is Stephen Lassen, of course, senior editor over at Athlon Sports. Stephen, we're both on zero sleep. We're going to try our best to get through this one. How you doing, buddy? Mike, anytime we fire up <laughs> SEC after dark, I could find the energy to get motivated <laughs> to talk some SEC ball. And as a um, as a little like pregame mediation, you know, we're going to think through this. Just take a step back. This time next week, two SEC teams will be starting spring practice in Auburn <laughs> and Missouri. So here we go again. There's there's always reasons to get excited around in this conference. Yeah. And man, I'm, I'm looking at the comments sections. I appreciate all y'all jumping in here. We're lo locked and loaded right out the, ga the gate here, Stephen. And another Stephen Lassen idea for the show. I love I love this one. We're going to rank the quarterback rooms in the SEC, 16 different quarterback rooms. We are going to rank from best to worst in the SEC for the 2024 season. And uh, Steven, since this was your idea, I was going to let throw it to you and have you explain a little bit just the criteria that, that you are specifically using, because I know you told me that you're leaning a little bit more towards the starters, but we're, we're factoring in the entire quarterback room. So why don't you kind of explain it in a little bit more detail? Yeah, so every year I do the positional rankings for the Athlon Sports uh, preseason magazine. This is your running back unit rankings, receivers, quarterback, offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, uh, defensive backs. On quarterbacks, probably a little bit different than any other position because you're going to be waiting heavily on the starter. Um, some teams that may have, and especially in this era where it's very hard to keep two or three good quarterbacks, for instance, maybe if we throw it back to when Ohio State had uh, Cardell Jones, JT Barrett, and Braxton Miller, maybe they didn't have a preseason All-American that year, but you had the quarterback in terms of the deep depth chart that could get you to number one. So every year when I do these, heavy emphasis on the starter. So I rank the starters, and then you sort of get into the kind of the backup situation to tweak maybe in sort of the tiers where they're really close. So uh, like I said, very starter-driven with some tweaks in there to account for good backups and depth. Yeah, to your point, Stephen, I because I did a little bit of a, a not quite the depth chart deep dive I know that you do, you, you basically live in, but I, I do have the depth charts here for all 16 SEC quarterback rooms, and I, I'm kind of blown away by, by how many are starting a true, or not starting, but true freshman is essentially penciled in today as the backup or – I mean, in some cases, we got to walk on at, at backups. And this is the freaking SEC. Missouri, unfortunately, Sam Horn just suffered, you know, a season-ending injury. So I don't even have a clue who their backup is at this point in time. But to your point, we'll be in spring football very soon in Columbia. So we'll have an opportunity to figure that out. And as always, there's another portal window coming. So this could all – it's probably not going to get blown up because I wouldn't imagine many SEC teams are bringing in starters – unless god forbid somebody gets injured in spring but uh well we keep our quarterbacks in, in bubble wrap here in spring for good reason because we, we want to see all these guys hit the field in the fall you know what yeah absolutely I, I was doing some thinking as you were running through the uh the missouri situation there trying to think of like what team like auburn bringing in peyton thorne last season after spring practice that you're probably not going to see too many of those situations unless some just high profile transfer hits the portal. There are some teams that have two and three guys uh, battling for the starting job. If one uh, it does not win the job, you could see some movement, but I think it's probably unlikely. Like I think your starters are probably going to be leaving a school to transfer in time to be there in spring ball. So uh, smartly keeping quarterbacks and bubble wrap is a good thing in spring practice. <laughs> Don't let those guys get hit. I think very broadly, a, 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 just a kind of a thought on the quarterbacks here. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I felt really I've, – I've been feeling this way since the end of last season, is that when you look at the group of quarterbacks returning for 2024, it is a very deep year and very talented uh, group of quarterbacks. I think there's probably like 10 I could have in my top 20, 25 right out of the gate for like preseason, pre-spring practice rankings. A top 10, yes, but I, I would say 11 through 16, 
maybe not so much. So let, let's start right there, Stephen. I, I'm curious who you've got as, uh, and let's just go in reverse order. Let's, let's, let's build the anticipation here all the way down as we, we count down to number one. Who do you have, Stephen? I'm curious to know if we have the same as uh, the number 16 quarterback room in the SEC heading into spring football. I have Vanderbilt. If you ask me who I think might be the better player out of that 13 to 16 range right now, I actually think Diego Pavia might rank a little higher on my list than 16. Uh, key transfer from New Mexico State. Uh, Vanderbilt also hired New Mexico State's offensive coordinator and Tim Beck. Of course, Jerry Kill is there as well. But I think getting Pavia was huge because they lost those three quarterbacks to the portal. Nate Johnson, a uh, transfer from Utah, more of a change of pace option. So I, I, as much as I like Diego Pavia, there is an unknown here, especially from Conference USA. How does that translate to play in SEC defenses every week? I don't think there's a ton of separation between 16 and 12 here, but I have Vanderbilt at 16. Well, I know I got something right when, when we're in agreement here. So uh, that's who I've got number 16 as well. And, and it's like you said, it's the, it's the transition. It's the unknown. We have seen, uh, you know, some some play here, for, but it wasn't even in, in a Vanderbilt uniform that we've seen these guys kind of excel in. So it's, man, I hate just putting Vanderbilt last in everything, but I feel like, uh, and this, I did rank it one through 16, but I kind of did tiers, and I kind of put Vanderbilt in a tier of their own as, I'm not saying they're awful, but it, it's kind of an unknown and, Honestly, if, I, if I'm putting a quarterback room dead last in the SEC, it's it's not even debatable for me. It's Vanderbilt right now. I think to your point on on Pavia, you know, he played well uh, when he was at New Mexico State against in that big win against Auburn. Uh, but with Vanderbilt losing so many pieces at receiver, you know, obviously with London Humphreys and Jaden McGowan and Will Shepard transferring, offensive line questions, you know, for Vanderbilt again. There's a lot of question marks here. So I don't think it's crazy to say here that, Vanderbilt solidified its quarterback room after losing three guys by bringing in the two transfers, but there's also still the element of the unknown uh, with all the transition and also just asking him to be week in and week out competing against SEC defenses with the question marks they have around him too. Yeah. All right, Steven, so who you got as the number 15 quarterback room in the SEC? I've got Arkansas. Uh, mm. And again, this is tough because I think you could slot Arkansas in at 12. I think you could slot them in at 13 or 14. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why I hesitate to rank them here is Bobby Petrino. I think Arkansas is going to have solid quarterback play out of somebody. And they have some interesting options. You know, Taylor Green, when he was at Boise State, 2022, looked like a rising star. Didn't play so well last season. Could be a lot of reasons for that. Um but you also have Jacoby Criswell, Malachi Singleton. There's an interesting group of quarterbacks for Arkansas. I will say one reason, and the team that's going to come up here in a minute, I ranked Mississippi State a little bit higher than Arkansas just because Blake Shapin is a little bit more proven at the Power 5 level right now. So um, a lot of questions for me for Arkansas, but I think also a lot of intrigue and potential. Well, interesting, because I've got them all the way up at 12, and – I, I agree with, with a lot of what you're saying, but I I like the fact that uh, Bobby Petrino kind of get, I don't know if hand-picked is the right word, but clearly he played a role in getting Taylor Green there to Fayetteville. I'm interested to see what he can do with him. Uh, what l little we've seen of Jacoby Criswell, he's got a big-time arm. And this maybe this is a play more for depth than anything else, Stephen, but in last year's spring game, Malachi Singleton, he was a four-star true freshman last season. I thought he flashed a little bit here. So I think we got three quality quarterbacks to work with in a Bobby Petrino offense. We know his his strong track record of developing quarterbacks. And I've said it before, I'll, I'll just keep continue to say it because it's absolutely true. I thought the three quarterbacks that Bobby Petrino had to work with at Texas A&M last year, Wigman, Max Johnson, and Jalen Henderson, I, I thought they all played their best college football that I've, that I've seen them play. So that's a credit to Bobby Petrino. So I, I got Arkansas a little bit higher. I got them at number 12. But I could certainly, again, a lot of unknown here. So it, it's not, I'm not completely saying you're wrong, Steven. I just, I like the depth more than anything. I like, I think that to your point on Petrino picking Taylor Green, 
I think there's a lot of things that they did with Jalen Henderson last year at Texas A&M. They can do with Taylor too. A lot of similar skill set. You know, I think getting getting him involved in the run game, what they can do with him as a passer, getting him developed this spring. And if it's not him, like you said, Criswell, some of the things we've seen in limited time. So I have a lot of trust in Bobby Petrino. Like I said, I had them 15, but honestly, I could have I had them in the same tier as all these teams all the way up to number 12. There's not a ton of difference right now. Uh, for me, for any of these teams. Right. And for so my 15, Stephen, is Mississippi State. And it's because, you know, Blake Shapin, he might be good in this offense. I, I think Jeff Levy clearly knows what he's doing. He'll get the most out of these quarterbacks. But I, I'm not sure who the backup is, but this is another one where I – one of those where I was, I was kind of noting, it could be Michael Van Buren, the true freshman, which he was an Oregon commit. I'm not – this is not to downgrade him by any means, but – if we and, and he may not even be the backup, but if our backup is a true freshman, I mean that tells you something. And your starter is a transfer that that didn't start a ton, uh, so this is more of a play of unknown. And, and are they ready ready for this level? I know Blake Shapin's got he's got some some tools to work with, from what I've seen from him at Baylor. He's he's a very talented guy. I think he'll be you know well suited to this offense. So I think he'll have a really good year, but th this is more of a play of, of lack of, of depth, at least that I'm aware of on Mississippi state's quarterback room. I've got Mississippi state at 14 in my rankings. So I, I share a lot of the same thoughts that you do. I think number one, I think Michael Van Buren, you know, I, I think he's got a chance if he can come in and get, pick up the offense right away. He's got a chance to probably play some this season. Um, I think Blake Shapin had some bad luck at Baylor with injuries the receiving core was turned over one year. The offensive line struggled. The scheme, is coaching staff, meshing didn't really seem – nothing seemed to fit well um, at Baylor over the last couple of years. But if you go back to the 2021 Big 12 championship game against a good Oklahoma State team, he led Baylor to an upset in that in that uh, game. So I think there is some upside here. Jeff Levy kind of handpicking – uh, you know, Blake Shapin kind of makes me – give me a little bit of confidence and maybe something that he's seen out of him at Baylor – this offense and this team, obviously, it's quarterback driven with the scheme and what they're going to be returning and losing from last season. So I've got Mississippi State at 14. I am very curious to see how shape and fits, but also fascinated to see about Van Buren, too, because being sort of the first freshman quarterback under Jeff Levy at Mississippi State's a big deal because he probably, like I said, was shaping, obviously sees something in him uh, potentially to come in and execute this offense right away. So my number 14, I'll be very curious to see where you have this quarterback room, Stephen. I got Kentucky with Brock Vandergriff, the Georgia transfer. They're very high on him. Bo Allen, who I had to do like a double take, Stephen. I was like, didn't he transfer? Yeah, he transferred. Then he transferred back. So he's back. So we got Bo Allen back. And then uh, they got a touted freshman, Cutter Boulier, I think is how you say his name. Again, true freshman. I don't. I don't. I can't think of a time, Stephen, when Mark Stoops played a freshman quarterback, other than when he maybe starter or backup got hurt. So, I'm, I'm not really expecting him to factor in. But if he is third string, I think you got three quality quarterbacks to work with. I just, I'm not buying fully into Brock Vandegrift. Now he he could be incredible, and I hope he is for Kentucky's sake. But I also think he came to play for Liam Cohen, and and, and that doesn't mean Bush Hartman is, isn't you know, going to do well down there, but it's, you know, it's, it's got to be a transition for him as well. So I, I just don't know what we're working with. I get it. He was a five-star. He played at Georgia. He stuck behind some incredibly talented quarterbacks. So he could be the next Joe Burrow for all I know. But uh, until we see him, I'm not quite buying into uh, the Brock Vandegrift hype, it, particularly in a Kentucky offense that we know they want to run the ball more than anything. I've got Kentucky a little bit higher. I have probably a little bit more uh, faith in Vandergriff. Maybe it's just a, a play on talent more than anything. Just the fact that he was so highly regarded coming out of high school. He's or his to, hair. You like his, his hair? His hair, probably. absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, he's been developed at Georgia uh, for the last couple of years too. But I do think to your point on, on Kentucky, kind of an interesting uh, run of quarterbacks. Will Levis, Devin Leary, and now Brock Vandegrift. Vandegrift of those three is the least proven, um, but he, from a high school recruiting standpoint, he's the most talented. And I will be very curious to see what Bush Hamden can do with him. We just talked about Taylor Green. 
His offensive coordinator at Boise State was Bush Hamden. That offense, mm. especially Green, didn't really take that step forward this year, kind of like we thought. So it'd be interesting to see how he develops. But overall, this is a, uh, you know, for Kentucky, you're pretty much all in on Vandergriff because, like you said, with the addition of a transfer and a freshman, either Vander- Vandergriff doesn't hit, it's going to be tough for Kentucky this year. So that basically all the eggs are in the Vandergriff basket right now. Mm-hmm. So who do you have at number 13 on your list, Stephen? I've got South Carolina. Uh, with Lenore Sellers. Um, I know I ran into some trouble last time with our, our South Carolina <laughs> friends about ranking uh, Sellers, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about his development in this offense. And also I think Robbie Ashford coming in as a transfer kind of almost signals where their South, the South Carolina team is going um, offensively. Question marks at the offensive line. I like what they did though in the portal at running back and receiver, but his limited work, the touchdown run against Vanderbilt, the passing early in the season, impressive, obviously a very small sample size, 12 through, you know, 16. Like I said, you could toss these up a different way. I just think I like sellers and I like the combination of Ashford coming in as a backup. Uh, So I had South Carolina up next. Yeah, that's exactly where I got him too, Steven. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the photo going around, but sellers out there looking like Jalen hurts with where he's, uh, he's uh, working out with like 800 pounds on the on the on the weight rack. So clearly getting stronger. The tush push coming to the, <laughs> exactly. the South Carolina playbook this year. <laughs> and Dow Long is he's got those NFL connections, so they're they're going to be doing it, no doubt. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I can't not hear hype about sellers from these South Carolina fans. They're over the moon on him. So I I hope he pans out. Be very fascinated to see how and and you know something that I've not really even considered, Stephen, because I criminally underrated Spencer Rattler last off season, and he was outstanding. He, he didn't get a lot of help around him, but we could be getting into a, a situation where I think he, I think it's would be asking too much for Sellers to be, you know, Spencer Rattler two point oh, diff, completely different skill set. But we, it could be a situation, Stephen, where maybe he fits the offense a lot better than Spencer Rattler, particularly if if the offensive line is still struggling, and, and he is, you know, Jalen Hurts 2.0. I mean, that, he'll fit in seamlessly down here, and, and clearly by adding Robbie Ashford, you know, we, we that's a sign to me that that, that we want a, a dual threat option at quarterback, whether it is Sellers, whether it is Robbie Ashford, who's played a lot of football in this conference. That's that's a reason why I got South Carolina a little bit higher on this list. Potential, experience, and then Dante Reno, true freshman, very talented player there as well. So three potential solid quarterbacks here for the Gamecocks. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things about uh, you know Reno this offseason as, as being someone that South Carolina is really high on for the future. So I think if you're South Carolina, you go into the season with a lot of question marks obviously at the quarterback position because you are starting a first-time starter, a guy who's only attempted four passes at the college level. But also, I think to your point, though, you've added Ashford, you've added Sellers. I think we can see where this offense is going, where they want to go uh, this year. So there's a lot of questions, but I I think to your point, I'm pretty optimistic about the future uh, for Sellers here in 2024. Yeah, shout out Rick. He just gave us a donation, 20 bucks. Appreciate you, Rick. He says, can't wait to watch Wigman. Ewers and Nico compete for the best gigum. I can't believe he threw Ewers in there. Come on, you're you're an Aggie. You're supposed to be talking <laughs> trash about these log horns. But uh, how about that? A ni- every Aggie I know is a nice person. So uh, nice, nice gamesmanship there. All right. So who, who you got on your list, Stephen, at number twelve? I have Kentucky. Uh, you're kind of making me rethink my South Carolina and Kentucky <laughs> rankings as we uh, we go here in real time. But, you know, it's really just when you look at South Carolina, I think there's a little bit more depth. I think if you're comparing Kentucky and South Carolina, I kind of just banked on at this point going into the spring, Brock Vandergriff, the talent winning out there, just such a highly touted quarterback with the, you know, like I said, developed the last few years at Georgia. I love Kentucky's receivers too, with a little bit more consistency, bringing back some experience in the offensive line. If Hamden's the right offensive coordinator, they can develop him. Um, they're going all in on, on Vandergriff, obviously. So I've got Kentucky at 12. To be honest with you, though, like I said, I could probably flip this with South Carolina just because they have a little bit more depth at this position. Right. And, and so I, I think I already mentioned it. That's This is where I got Arkansas as my number 12. 
kind of already dove into why I like them more more a more a play about depth than any because all these guys no idea who the I mean you could talk me into Green Criswell and even Singleton if if he takes a big step forward I think all these guys could start and they can have success in a Bobby Petrino offense but very little separation like you've kind of alluded to between this and, and probably Mississippi State I mean you you could kind of talk me into any order for for these teams so far. So we're we're at number eleven, Stephen, and I got Auburn. And, and the only difference, because I'm I'm not sold on Peyton Thorne. And I even got I got little graphics. I don't have these for all the quarterbacks, but Peyton Thorne, obviously not a massively successful season, but he he's got that experience. He's he'll be in year two in Hugh Fre- Well, <laughs> I guess year one of Hugh Freeze's offense, but year two at Auburn. So he kind of knows what he's getting into a little bit. But the numbers aren't pretty. If you're just listening back to this later, he was 11th in, in passing yards and completions in the SEC last season, 13th in, in touchdown to interception ratio, and 14th in yards per attempt. So I'm not sold on Peyton Thorne. Hugh Free seems to love him. And, you know, the hopes of, of having a, a truly breakout season may rest on Peyton Thorne taking that big step forward, which I don't quite have, have confidence that he's going to do it. I don't either. Um, I think maybe probably if you want to be an optimistic Auburn fan, I think the optimism would be that it is the second one and a half years of Hugh Freeze in the offense and maybe adding some weapons like a Cam Coleman coming in as a freshman that you have a better supporting cast this year. And then we also saw that Jarquez Hunter, it felt like during the stretch, he really started to kind of round into the form that we thought he might be the play that might kind of play early in the season. So I think if you're optimistic and you're Auburn, it's sort of experience plus improving supporting cast. Maybe everybody's on the same page this year. Uh, but I think that being said, though, that you know, you you showed that graphic interceptions, too many interceptions last year, bottom of the SEC in completion percentage and yards per attempt. To me, the question here is how fast can you get Walker uh, White ready to play? Uh, because I think when you look at Hank Brown or Garen, or it really feels like Walker White's going to be is the handpicked guy to be the future uh, for Auburn's offense. So I've got Auburn at 11 at, as well, I think. All right, so into the top 10. Now we're getting to this is where we were talking about. There's a lot of good quarterback rooms in the SEC, the, the top 10. Who do you start that list with at number 10, Stephen? I've got Oklahoma at 10. Uh, I feel very, very good about Jackson Arnold as a breakout candidate for this year. I think he's a rising star. And if you look behind him, uh, the depth, it could be a true freshman, or it could be Casey Thompson, the well-traveled Casey Thompson, who's been at Nebraska, he's been at Texas, he's been at Florida Atlantic. So uh, assuming he's 100%, he gives them a veteran backup. But this is, to me, is all about we've reached the top 10 and all 10 of these situations, all 10 of these starting quarterbacks are top 20, 25 quarterbacks in my mind. And like I said, like what Jackson Arnold did in the bowl game, the turnovers were a problem, but I think that gets worked out with a little bit more experience. So I got Oklahoma at 10. You know, it's interesting. That's right where I got them too, Stephen. And uh, I did want to – I should have fact-checked this, but I figured you would know. Do they still have General Booty down there? Because, I mean, that's that's an all-time name. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the roster yeah. last year. Yeah, but I, <laughs> He's he's uh, first team, uh, all-name team depth chart in our heart, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I echo everything you said about Jackson Arnold. I mean, they're, they're over the moon about him and his potential. And just the fact, Stephen, and, and maybe it's part of the NIO world we live in now, but the fact that uh, I don't want to say they show – Dylan Gabriel the the door or anything because he was highly successful, but the fact that he left it for another school, I don't think it's because they, uh, you know, you know because he because Oklahoma was the problem. I think they knew, hey, we got this this kid behind him. He needs to see the field, otherwise we may lose him. So, it, you know, if you're gonna choose one, I, and again, I don't know exactly if that's how it played out, but you can't lose a guy with three potential seasons for for a guy with one. So that should tell you all you need to know about his potential. He was a five-star. Like he said, I, you know, he came out, he looked pretty shaky it, it, to, in the bowl game. And I was thinking, my goodness, this guy is, he ain't it. And then he caught <laughs> fire. And I was like, oh, okay, I see it now. And then, you know, it, it kind of, he, he tailed off at the end. But that that's what you expect from a true freshman. Now he's a, the established starter for Oklahoma 
And this may be one, Stephen, where we look back. And again, I know we're doing the entire room, but we may look back at the end of the season and say, man, how do we have Jackson Arnold at Oklahoma, but number 10 on this list? He's one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC. I, I fully would buy that narrative if, if that's the case come December. Yeah, 100%. I, I think there's a couple different quarterbacks here. When I do my rankings, I'm thinking he could be higher at the end of the year. He could be higher at the end of the year. It speaks to the depth and also the talent situation for some of these teams in the SEC this year that Oklahoma's 10th, but they may be top 25 quarterback room uh, nationally because of Jackson Arnold. Uh, but I think to your point, you know, there, I think there are going to be some early ups and downs, especially as Oklahoma works through the offensive line turnover this season. But I think if you remove that shaky start in the bowl game and you look past some of the turnovers, the skill set is there to have kind of that monster year, plus the Oklahoma receiving core with some of the weapons that they have. I feel really good about Arnold's development uh, and potential. To your point, three years of him uh, potentially versus one of Gabriel. I think it's an easy choice if you're Oklahoma. Yep. All right, so who do you have number nine on your list, Stephen? I got the Florida Gators at number Ooh. nine. I think why do you hate Florida? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, this is we hate to keep repeating, but we're in that situation where like all of these could be a little bit higher. Um, uh, but there's so many good quarterback situations in the SEC here. But I think to the positive of Florida, Graham Mertz was probably one of the biggest surprises for me, one of the bigger breakout quarterbacks. A big question mark at Wisconsin ended up being probably you know a fringe all conference candidate last year, you know, efficiency. The completion rate was there. I think you'd like to see maybe a few more big plays. Curious to see how fast DJ Lagway gets on the field. He's selling that hope and optimism if you're Florida uh, for 2025 and beyond. And if you're Billy Napier, you've got to win this season. So I, I feel really good about Florida. Obviously, two good quarterbacks, but somebody's got to be nine, and it's Florida for me. Mm, well, remember, he's at. Athlon Steven, that, that ain't my list. Well, we, we, I got Florida a lot higher, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, believe it or not, Steven, I got Tennessee number nine. And, and I'm a big fan of, of Nico, clearly. I, you know, what he did in the bowl game I thought was pretty spectacular, uh, per, potential, uh, specifically scoring touchdowns in the red zone, which Tennessee, people probably tired of me referencing this stat, but they were hovering around 120th in scoring Red zone touchdowns with Joe Milton as their starting quarterback. They scored a touchdown on every red zone possession with Nico as your starting quarterback against an alleged elite defense. So that it, it speaks to Nico, you know, his potential. I, th I think he's going to be out of this world. But again, we're rating the entire quarterback room. And this is one of the ones I referenced, Stephen, where the backup is a walk on Gaston Moore. Now, he may not be the backup because they, they signed a, a pretty touted quarterback, Jake Merklinger, true freshman. He may be the backup come season, but I, I think it's going to be Gaston Moore. So, again, I, I can't say I rated Arkansas high because of the overall depth and then not dock Tennessee for for overall depth. So this is a play more for overall depth. You know, I, I hope and pray Nico plays the entire season because if not, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, t Tennessee is going to be in trouble if, if, if Nico's not there. You know what? Yeah, I've got Tennessee higher just simply because of the kind of like we talked about. I looked at starters and put a heavy weight on the starter, and I think Nico's going to be a top five to six quarterback in the SEC this season. So if uh, to to your point, I think you're right in ranking Florida higher because of the depth, but I gave Tennessee the bump because I think Nico's just going to be that dang good this year. Yeah. Um, all right, so who do you got? Where are we at here on, on your list here, Stephen, number nine? Or, or, or you did Florida, right? So who's number eight? I've got Texas A&M. Uh, this, this is another one that I feel very good about, and I think it's another situation where I think Connor Wigman could easily finish high, much higher on this list. It would not surprise me if he is one, two, three, uh, all-conference at the end of the year. But trying to rate starters here, comparing Connor Wigman to Brady Cook at this point, you know, I think Cook is more proven. But I like obviously love the upside of Connor Wigman. It looked like he was on his way last season, to delivering that breakout year. He unfortunately got hurt. Ton of credit for how he played against Miami. Took a took a beating, kept on playing well. And I think this year we saw what uh Bobby Petrino did with Jalen Henderson at the end of last season. Henderson is back. Marcel Reed also I thought he played pretty well considering the circumstances in the bowl game. But I just love the potential for Connor Wigman to break out 
uh, in Colin Klein's offense. So I've got them eighth, but really this is probably a top 15, 12 quarterback situation in college football. No respect for Florida. No respect for A&M. Steven, what are we doing here? I, I got them a lot higher on my list. Well, I'll get to them in a minute, but I've got – I got LSU at eighth. And and I do think Garrett Nussmeyer could be really good next season. Uh, I, I know they added via the transfer portal to kind of help out at receiver. And, you know, it's not like the, the cupboard is, is bare by any means. They could have the best offensive line in the SEC. They could have one of the better tight ends in uh, Mason Taylor in the SEC. But uh, so I got I, – I like Nuss. But what do we got behind him? Ricky Collins, touted recruit. They just signed a Colin Hurley, a, a touted true, true freshman, who's you know be third or fourth string. We'll see, but uh, again, this is maybe a little bit of a play for experience. And and I know Nussmeyer didn't start a ton, started the bowl game, seen him at other times during his college career. Not a ton of separation, but I I like the overall room just a hair better than Tennessee. So that that's why I got LSU number eight. Throw in AJ Swan as well, the transfer from uh, Vanderbilt. So they, they, I think that's a pretty solid all-around room. They have an experienced backup to go with a rising star in Nussmeyer, who I like a lot as well. Throw in, like you said, Ricky Collins, and then I think the hope is the uh, the quarterback coming in next year. Uh, could he be even better than any of the guys in the room right now? So <laughs> I, I've I've actually got LSU at seven, um, kind of this, for the same reasons you do. I think Nussmeyer is a rising star. Um, I think the offense will still be very good. Probably not Jaden Daniels and Mike Dimbrock level of production, but what they've done in the portal to reload a receiver to go with one of the country's best offensive lines. I think this LSU offense is still going to be in good shape. You know, that's one thing that um, I apologize, Stephen. I probably should have mentioned this earlier because I didn't necessarily factor this in, and it doesn't sound like you did either. But when you get a change at offensive coordinator, you know that could be devastating to uh, to a guy that has no experience. Not, I'm not saying that's the case for Garrett Nussmeyer because he's got experience. But um, did did you factor in play callers and things of that nature into your list, or, or at all, or or maybe even just a little? A little bit. Um, you know, as we're doing this list, I'm kind of having a little bit of buyer's remorse because I probably should have maybe added a little bit more from starter, taking a little bit of weight off the starter, add it to the backup to, to your point. I've, I've always been pretty heavy into waiting like your starter, because to your point, like with Tennessee, like with Kentucky, if your starter goes down, you're pretty much screwed anyways in this era of college football, because keeping a good backup and a good uh, third string is, is very difficult. But and I think on LSU specifically, I think maybe the optimism here is Joe Sloan has been a coach that everybody behind the scenes has been very, um, has been very highly praised, highly regarded for his work, quarterbacks coach. So it should be pretty seamless transition working with Nussmeyer, but it is different. You know, it just because the same playbook is there, the same players, same, you know, every year is going to be different. So I, I do wonder uh, a little bit about LSU and how far the offense could drop off, but Sloan's got the, the pedigree, I think, and being the quarterback coach to help Nussmeyer continue to develop. Now, one offense, I don't expect to have any drop off, Stephen, I, and I think you're right there with me. It's number seven on my list, Missouri. And even at number seven, you might be, well, what the heck? Brady Cook's awesome, right? He is awesome. But, you know, we alluded to it. Anybody that missed it, I'm sure Mizzou fans know. But uh, back up, Sam Horn out for the season. Suffered a, I think it was a Tommy John surgery. So, so he's out, and and the, I literally have no idea, and I don't even think Missouri has an idea of who their backup's going to be. They're probably going to have to go to the portal to get some depth. But how attractive of a quarterback can you get, given that uh, we got Brady Cook back, and we got Sam Horn that hopefully he's fine for for twenty twenty five. I mean, it's it's a tough proposition to sell a quarterback on. But uh, we do love Brady Cook. I think he's a top five quarterback, maybe even in the country, not just the SEC. So I feel bad putting Missouri seventh. But again, this is this is a play for me overall depth-wise. I, I got Missouri as the number seven quarterback room. I think Aiden Glover, the true freshman, is probably going to end up being the backup for Missouri right now. I do think if there is a team that could be looking for an experienced backup in the portal, maybe that's not going to be a starter somewhere else. 
but is just essentially a veteran sort of proven arm, Missouri might be wise to add somebody just in case because that drop off from Cook to Glover to someone else could be pretty steep at this point. So wouldn't surprise me if they added somebody. But that's the next team, Mike, on my rankings. I've got Missouri six. Um, I, I love what Brady Cook did last season. I mean, before the season, a major question mark for Missouri. He was booed. That early season game against Kansas State kind of started that momentum uh, for Missouri this year. He really took off under the development of uh, Kirby Moore as offensive coordinator. Love Missouri's receiving core coming back next season, too. So there is a uh, a lot of unknown about the backup situation for Missouri, but I think Brady Cook continues to be one of the probably nation's most underrated quarterbacks, and I think he's going to have another standout year in 2024. Yeah. So number six on my list, Stephen, you already hit on him. You've already downgraded them Aggies. Give, give me them Aggies at number six. I, I love Connor Wigman and his potential. I, you know, I think he would have had a massive year had he not gotten injured last year. Uh, I liked what I saw. I didn't even know who Jalen Henderson was, but he brought a spark to that Texas A&M roster. Glad to see him back. Uh, I think he fits this offense to a T. So again, I mean, we may be, this may be a situation where we play two quarterbacks. I don't know. And then even you referenced this as well, Marcel Reed it in the bowl game. I, I know they lost, they were undermanned and, and all that. But whenever I see a true freshman, when they hit the field, I, the main thing I'm looking for, Stephen, is if the game's too big for him. And I didn't get that feeling at all with Marcel Reed. So I think A&M, you can make the case, you know, I'm looking at some of these other rosters. They may have the best three man quarterback room in the entire SEC. So number six may not even be high enough for them. I mean, it probably should have put them a little bit higher, but now we're getting into the upper echelon where, where I think the top six quarterback rooms in particular were, are very, very tight and, and very little separation for me here. Same here. Uh, I, I think, you know, I had A&M at eight, and you've got them at six. I think by the end of the season, we could look back and just say that is entirely too low because Connor Wigman had the breakout year or Jalen Henderson picks up where he left off and ends up beating Wigman out for the starting job. So this is, you know, I, I don't, this is an interesting room too, because we talked about spring practice coming up in the spring portal window. They can't transfer within the sec, but could there be some other teams that be starting to look around at some of these depth charts and go, a and M's kind of loaded. Uh, Alabama's got some options. Ole Miss has some uh, depth here too. So um, it'll be interesting uh, to see if there's any departures, but I think if I'm an a and fan, I feel very good about Connor Wigman and I also feel better about the system and the coaching around him to help him take that next step in 2024. All right, so now we're into the top five, Stephen. Who you got as a top five quarterback room in the SEC? I got Tennessee. I oh. think that I think that you know, here we go again with the uh, play on to, uh, kind of the one quarterback, a sort of emphasis, heavy emphasis on the starter, and with the it, kind of expectation for Nico to have a breakout season. I'm very high in his potential. Uh, for this uh, this 2024 season being an all-conference candidate. So I'm just very high on Nico. I think the breakout's coming. I know the backup situation is a bit of a question mark, but if we're giving heavy weight to the starter and we think he's going to be that good, it is a projection. I've got Tennessee at five. Yeah, and shout out uh, Carl Jenkins, big fan of the show. And this is a point you've made as well, Stephen. I mean, balls down year last season, but under Heupel, I, I think it's his worst offensive output and still winning nine football games. So, you know, that that is a credit if Nico lives up to the hype, which we're, we're already kind of seeing that it, that in his brief time on the field that he he is worth worthy of the hype. You, I may have underrated him. I'm fine underrating Tennessee. I, I feel like when, when you overrate him, that's when you're in trouble, lad. So, uh, yeah, top five, that's that's pretty bold, Stephen, because we're getting into the upper echelon. But uh, I get it because, because like I said, I mean, I'm not ready to to put Nico into, like, Heisman candidate, but I'm, I'm seeing other people do it. And, and not, not that he should be the front runner. I mean, that's crazy. But if he breaks out, if Tennessee wins 9, 10, 11 games, it's going to be because he is – an outstanding quarterback. Can I can I make the case he is a Heisman contender? Yeah, have a you're, the floor is yours. <laughs> hey, look, I, I think let's. I mean, think about every year we see you know quarterbacks. The, the Heisman is a very quarterback driven award, 
And we often see, you know, whether it was Joe Burrow coming out of not necessarily nowhere, but he had the big breakout season. You know, every year there are quarterbacks who come from a little bit off the radar. Caleb Williams wasn't the Heisman favorite at at USC, ended up winning it that season. So Nico is the type of quarterback that if I was going to put down money this preseason for a guy who was not going to be the Carson Beck, uh, the pick to everyone's preseason favorite, Nico would be a guy that I would put some serious uh, kind of dark horse cash on because of the offense. The stats are going to be there. The Tennessee schedule is pretty favorable. And like I said, if you're going to take a shot at someone uh, that's not a front runner, to me, that's Nico. Uh, so I, I think he's definitely a Heisman candidate. Yeah. And uh, for whatever reason, I mean, I don't agree with this, Stephen, but it, it feels like whoever we go into the season hyping up as like a the front runner or, or top three, it's not, it's not, you know, living up to that. It's almost like we, not, not I say we, but I, I'm talking Heisman. I'm not a Heisman voter, but it just seems like they want to like tear him down or something. Or like like one bad game, it's like, well, he just lost the Heisman. Instead of, what about the other eleven games where he's outstanding? He we can't just he can't have it. I don't know. That's a different conversation. But to your point, it's it's kind of like it's they get obsessed with like the shiny new toy as opposed to the solid guy that that had all this hype. And maybe didn't quite live up to the nine months of, of offseason hype that that was heaped on them. Should have mentioned Jaden Daniels. I mean, he's kind of the classic case of, you know, last season, you go back to 2022, and there was plenty of talk. Jaden Daniels wasn't aggressive enough throwing the ball downfield. Maybe they should change quarterbacks. He just gets better. Then this year, he just takes off. So some some quarterback this year is going to take off. To your point, like the shiny new toy in the room, to me, that's a five-star quarterback who has a ton of hype around him, who played well in the bowl game, and is going to put up monster stats in the offense. So to me, I've, I've got Nico on my Heisman uh, preseason watch list for sure. Very high on him. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, they want to forget this, Stephen, but there were, you know, I will, I, clearly not the majority, but there were LSU fans saying, we got to go with Garrett Nussmeyer. We saw what he did against Georgia's defense. He was throwing it all over the yard, which he did. But man, that would have been the biggest blunder of, of all time blunders that they set Jaden Dales. It, it, Garrett Nussmer, he may be awesome, but clearly Jaden Dales was was special. All right, so uh, my my top five, Stephen. We haven't hit this one yet. I'm curious to see where you got him. I got Ole Miss, and again, we're we're getting into the upper echelon here. You. You could probably talk me into Ole Miss being number one because I like Jackson Dart, year three, starting in Kiffin's system. He should have an insane year. Walker Howard, former touted recruit at LSU, he probably thought he'd be starting by now. But, you know, he's got a world of talent. Austin Simmons, the guy they they kind of like stole away from Florida. I mean, this is a talented, talented Ole Miss quarterback room. Uh, but I, I think... And I don't know. I, I like just the four I got above them slightly, slightly better. Thoughts on, on Ole Miss there at, at number five? I wrestled with two through, I should say, actually three and four a lot on my list. And Ole Miss is one of those teams in the mix here. Uh, I actually have Ole Miss just a little bit higher than you do. And I, I really, I, this is where I wrestled with them because Ole Miss and Alabama to me is like a coin flip. I think they're both pretty even. You know, probably whoever you vote all conference this year first, if it's Dart or Milrow, probably needs to be uh, ranked a little bit higher. But I've, so I've got Ole Miss at three and I've got Alabama at four. And, I'll, and I kind of touch on Ole Miss here. I, I think to your point on, on Jackson Dart, I think, you know, the, the growth from 2022 to 2023, it was there. Um, you He was, he, Ole Miss brought in competition for him and Walker Howard and Spencer Sanders. He beat him out and got better. And he's sort of the catalyst for that offense. And I think you see whether it's the short stuff, the long throws, uh, the efficiency, being able to to be a factor in the run game too, might even be even more needed this year without Quinshot Judkins on the ground. So I, I love the fact that now third year in the system, they've got some depth behind him. That's why I had Ole Miss as uh, the number three quarterback room in the SEC. So I'm, I'm just as high on him as you are there. Yeah, and you said you got Bama four. That's exactly where I got him. So, again, very, very little separation in my mind. But I think Jalen Milrow is underrated, and I think playing for Kalen Abor is a heck of a lot better than playing for Tommy Reese. So I, I think Jalen Milrow could be even better. And, and, again, this was maybe a little bit of a play of, of 
a little bit better depth. And I like Milro just a hair better than Dart. We got Ty Simpson. They were apparently blown away last training camp with Dylan Logarin, who was a true freshman, who some people suggested he may even be the starter last year. So I, I like that. They just got the kid from, uh, I believe, Washington, Austin Mack, who obviously Kalen DeBoer very familiar with. So this may be the only quarterback room in the SEC as it currently is constituted that has four legitimate quarterbacks that could start for Alabama this season. And, and again, I, that may be a little bit too bold because I think it's Jalen Milrow and, and he's probably leading it by a country mile. But I'm, I'm just saying I, this is a deep, talented room. And this may be one to your point, Stephen, and, and they won't transfer within the SEC because of the rules. But if there's one quarterback room that may suffer a defection, it's probably this this Alabama one. I think fair to say that Ty Simpson might be on the like the watch list of quarterbacks who could be on the move just from a pure number standpoint, but also bringing in Austin Mack, a guy from Washington who Kalen DeBoer was very high on at Washington. And also I think he's key because he knows the offense and could sort of be, I guess, an early kind of younger mentor to some of these other ones as they try to learn the scheme. I'm very curious to see how this Alabama offense operates this year. Because if you look at Jalen Milrose numbers from an advanced number standpoint, like the short stuff and the long passes, he excelled at the middle of the field. The numbers aren't good there, just from an efficiency and, and everything else. So that that's kind of the next step for him is to kind of unlock that 10 to 19 uh, yard, the intermediate throwing game and just continue to progress. But on the on the positive side, if you're Jalen Milrow in Alabama, look what Kalen DeBoer did for Michael Penix. Um, he was solid at Indiana. He became an All-American in Washington. And you also saw what he did with Jay Kaner at Fresno State. He was one of the best group of five quarterbacks in the country. So um, I think a lot of optimism there for Milrow. The tools, the physical skill set, it's all there. You saw the in-season growth too. So I think a lot of uh, a lot of reasons to be optimistic that Milrow can be even better this year with Kalen DeBoer uh, and that offense and, and sort of uh, kind of developing. Right, and I forgot to shout out, uh, you know, he was second in the SEC, Stephen, in yards per attempt, which is a critical stat, and uh, second in rushing, and, and my goodness, 12 rushing touchdowns. I mean, he, he is just so dynamic. So uh, I, I think he is he's criminally underrated this offseason. So he's a big reason why I'm a believer in Alabama's quarterback room. Uh, Cousin Shane, oh, he made the chat. He says, Bam in the top five is just me muscle memory. <laughs> that, that may be fair. That may be fair. Uh, but, all right, so, Stephen, we are now – you had you, you had Ole Miss three, so I'll go my three. And this is the one you completely disrespected, Stephen. You had a number nine. I'm going Florida Gators, believe it or not, because Graham Mertz, man, he, he blew me away. And, and not that he was like – some Heisman candidate or something, but the completion percentage was off the charts, even though, you know, they, they barely threw the ball down the field. I get it. But, you know, he shined at, in moments. The offense was not the problem. I didn't think for the Florida Gators, it was that God awful defense bringing in DJ Lagway, everything I've heard, everything I've seen. He is the real deal for them Florida Gators. So, yeah, not as deep as some of these other rooms that, that we have referenced, but I think potentially, Steve, potentially the best one, two, maybe not the best, but I mean, w w splitting hairs here, D top three. That, that, that's why I got top three for Florida Gators because, again, when we're getting down to the third string quarterback, you're in real trouble if you're playing your third string quarterback <laughs> anyway. So uh, I, I think a top three one two option in the SEC is the Florida Gators. Give me give me Florida at number three. You know, think about how far Florida's offense came from that season opener against Utah. Remember how bad that went for Utah for Florida that night? <laughs> I mean, I know Mertz threw for 333 yards, but a lot of it was the short stuff. And I mean, some of it came late in the game too. Uh, but to finish the year throwing for 73 uh, completion percentage, being that efficient, I mean, I would like to see them stretch the field a little bit more in 2024, but you know, for a guy that came in and was projected, I think, either to be 13th, 14th in the league in quarterback ratings in the offseason to finish as one of the better, you know, like I said, a fringe all-conference candidate and to go into this season as a strength and can be a good bridge quarterback uh, to Lagway. Obviously, Lagway is the future, 
there's your optimism if you're Florida that he can even elevate this offense to another level. I am fascinated to see how this dynamic works out. Does he play right away? Do they change him as a change of pace? Does he end up taking over the starting job? Either way, Florida's in a great spot for the, the quarterback situation this year. The only thing I would disagree with, though, Stephen, and, and I, I keep hearing this narrative where, you know, if, if, it, if it goes poorly for Billy Napier, I mean, he may not survive anyway, but, you know, if he goes six and six, which, again, is not the standard at Florida, but they somehow get lagway on the field and he's spectacular, and then people will say, well, we got to hang on to the Billy because we don't want our quarterback to leave. But I've, I've heard that spun as like a positive, like that, that could buy Billy Napier more time. But it could also, it could divide the locker room and we could play a guy before he's ready because it's going so poorly where Billy says, well, we, we got to give him hope about something. And then we, I don't want to say ruined because that's not the right word, but maybe he's just not ready and, and maybe they should be playing Graham Mertz and playing lagway caught. So, I mean, they're in a sticky situation, no doubt. But I, I, I got faith in them, but I, d I don't know that I have faith in Billy Napier to, uh, to, to manage that room, so to speak. You know, what? I think what's also interesting about the schedule for Florida is if you were going to hand over the offense to a young quarterback, it almost would be better if your schedule was reversed. You know, the tougher parts of the schedule come early, allowing him some time to develop maybe behind the scenes, and then you turn it over to him down the stretch where things are going to get a little easier. There's not really many breaks on Florida's schedule. It's very <laughs> difficult. Let's, let's just be honest here. But I think, you know, with the way the early season schedule sets out, I mean, if Mertz gets off to a slow start against Miami, what's the call is going to be? Lagway's got to start against Sanford, get him ready to play Texas A&M. So it is a fascinating dynamic uh, to see how this plays out for Florida. The good news is I think they have two quarterbacks they can win with, and with some of those toss-up games, on the schedule, you know, maybe there is, there probably is a path here for Florida to get to six and six, seven and five and a chance for Billy Napier to survive this year. All right, Steven. So we've only got two left and neither one of us has used one of these teams. So we got the same two. I'm curious to see if we have them in the same order, Steven, who do you have as the number two quarterback room in the SEC? Give me the Texas Longhorns at two. Um, I debated Texas and Georgia, and here's my thinking on having Georgia at one. I, I think Carson Beck is the best returning quarterback in the SEC on, on coming into the spring practice. So that was really the difference maker for me. But I think on the positive side for Texas, certainly you could make a case for them at number one. Quinn Ewers made the jump you wanted to see from 2022 to 2023 the completion percentage was better the yards per attempt was better um you know just six interceptions on you know, almost 400 passing attempts now the question is if you start looking at the draft boards for after the 2024 season he could be one of the first quarterbacks off the uh, off the board next year so that can he make the jump that he did this year take another step forward as texas comes into the sec because if he can there's a good chance that Texas is playing for the SEC championship, and there's a good chance they can go far in the college football playoff. And, oh, by the way, they have Arch Manning too. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, this was a tough one for me, Stephen, but mm, I hate to say it. I went the other way. I went Texas one, Georgia number two. But, again, by the slightest of margins, you could talk me in one way or another, and, and maybe it's not fair because I, I – I guess I gave the edge to Texas because of Sarkeesian playing in this offense. That's not to criticize Mike Bobo because I think he gets criticized. Well, obviously he gets criticized quite a bit. <laughs> I, some of it may be warranted, but I, I don't think it's as warranted as, as some people make it out to be. Uh, that It is kind of the unknown with Arch Manning. Will he or won't he live up to the hype? Uh, you know That could certainly be the difference right there. But I like... Texas is one, two, uh, slightly better than Georgia, Carson Beck, Gunnar Stockton. And that may not be fair, Stephen, because Gunnar Stockton could be better for Arch Manning for all I know. And I do think Carson Beck, at least at this point in time, I think he's better than Quinn Ewers. So, Agreed. again, I, I'm splitting hairs here. You know, you could put you could put Georgia number one. I'm fine with it. You could put Texas number one. I'm fine with it. But I, I just like Texas uh, just by a hair better 
And I, I like the fact, and I, I don't know, I don't I don't follow NFL or draft stuff, but I would imagine both these guys, in fact, you know, it's it's a certainty, I would think, that they both get drafted. But how high would they have got drafted? I don't know. But I like the fact that they've come back to work on their craft to potentially be the number one overall pick in the 2025 draft. I think I think they'll both if, if viewers and Beck progress and, and are even better this fall, they're probably gonna be battling for that next spring to be the the top quarterback taken. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, seeing some of the early chatter among scouts and NFL teams for next season. There's actually a kind of a void right now of who's going to be that first quarterback off the board in 2025. Like, there's no doubt this year it'll be Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy's in there as well. It's kind of wide open next year. So that there's an opportunity here, to your point, for both Carson Beck and Quinn Ewers to come back, improve their stock and potentially be uh, the first quarterback off the board, maybe the number one overall pick next year. It, it, it's it's a close call between Georgia and Texas in my mind. I just went, I had Carson Beck one in my quarterback ratings. That kind of weighed, he- like I said, the starter weighs heavily. That's why I gave them at number one. Also, I, I liked what I saw at a Gunner Stockton in the Orange Bowl. I know Florida State was shorthanded, but I thought he played well. And I think Georgia set up, uh, if something happens to Carson Beck during the season that Stockton can pick up where he left off. If Dylan Raiola committed to Georgia and was there, would you put the Bulldogs at one? <laughs> uh, I would, but Kurt Herbstreit <laughs> sure wouldn't. I'll tell you that. No, I'm just yeah. yeah. I, I think I think that potentially would be. Uh, and I still think you know I I don't think he would be the backup or anything. I still think it would be Gunner. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I've talked to guys like Rusty Manziel. They love this Ryan. I'm, I'm going to butcher his name. Pug, puzzle, Lizley, whatever. They love that kid. So yeah, we, you, th- you throw in a potential number one overall quarterback, which I, I don't think that's where he ended up. I think it was DJ Lagway, but you know, again, splitting hairs here, I would probably give that edge to Georgia if they had one more talented arm, because I think you would make the case. Georgia's got four incredibly good quarterbacks where texas we've got one we got one with massive potential but i don't know that we have a third even though they they got a a true freshman trey owens i believe is his name they like him but um yeah and custer says what if brock stayed (laughs) again i i i don't know i'm I'm not on the brock bandwagon so uh yeah that that probably would have been the difference for me steven that's an interesting way to look at it yeah, I, I think the theme here is you can't go wrong with either Georgia or Texas at one in these rankings. And frankly, I mean, Ole Miss, Alabama, these are four of the top five, just deepest starter backup situations all in college football. I mean, you could throw Oregon, throw Ohio State in there uh, from outside the SEC. But these are this is a great year for quarterbacks in the SEC. The quarterback rooms at the top of the conference look great. So um, it, it's it's a much different situation than we entered in last year, because coming into 2023, there were a lot of questions about like where who's the where's the the kind of the the pecking order at quarterback. Was it going to be Jane Daniels? Was it KJ Jefferson? Was it Will Rogers? Who was going to emerge this year? It's like good luck and kind of trying to rank the top you know nine ten quarterbacks in this league. It's so deep for 2024. Yeah. Well, Stephen, I mean, we're sitting here, middle February, debating quarterbacks, rankings, and, and uh, I just un- unplugged my cord here. I got so excited thinking <laughs> about this fall already. But uh, any closing thoughts before we wrap up here? I think two things kind of on my radar here. I think the first one is, you know, kind of like we started uh, the show was that Missouri and Auburn start spring practice next week so <laughs> it's here uh you know we're, we're ready to to get things kicked off for for another season of sec ball and it, it's spread around the corner the other thing is um the college football playoff i guess they f- we're finally figuring out what the format's going to be for this season <laughs> it's like five five uh you know guaranteed and seven at large spots but there is something interesting that came out today and i think how this impacts the sec is that they're studying apparently 14 teams and 16 teams for 2026 and beyond. And that tells me that's good news, obviously, for the, if you're a team in the SEC, because that means either more at-large spots or that means more guaranteed spots for the SEC. So just something to watch over the next couple of weeks and months as uh, they try to figure out the format that will be 
used at the end of 2024 season. And just as, as soon as they figure it out, Stephen, they'll change it again. So we, have, uh, we, haven't, we haven't even had a season of the 12 team <laughs> playoff. And we're already thinking about 14 to 16. So. <laughs> All right, Stephen, I appreciate your time. As always, before you go, can you tell the audience how can they find you? How can they uh, find your work? Absolutely. So you can follow me on Twitter at Aflon Steven. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook, Stephen L CFB, YouTube, all CFB 365. And uh, please be sure to check out uh, the Aflon Sports Cover 2 College Football Podcast. We come out on Wednesdays covering all things in the great sport of college football. Yeah, so I appreciate you, as, as always, Stephen. And if you made it this far, please like, subscribe to the video. We don't ask for much, but that, that's what we want from you, just to subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends that may like the show. We're trying to build the best SEC show out there, and we can't do it without support from each and every one of you. But that's going to do it for this episode. We'll catch you on the next one.